genuinely hate universities. I was in the hospital with her and I was like, mom, by the way, you've never broken any bones, have you? She's like, yes, one time when your dad pushed me out the car while we were driving. I think everyone should rush to make five or 10,000 or 15,000 a month. I bought my mom a $4 million house. That's their dream. You can never take someone's dream away from them. Ah, what's up guys and welcome back to First Things Thirst. We have a very special guest today, a man who needs no introduction, Iman Gadzi. How are you doing? I'm good, I'm good. Thank you for having me on. Uh, thank you very much. I remember I started this podcast about, it was almost a year ago, and you were one of the first people I wanted to have on, obviously, but you said to me, no can do, I'm afraid. I'm uh, saying no to podcasts, ask me again in a year. Mm. And I did, and here we are a year later, so you're a man of your word. Thank you very much. Yeah, I told you I'd make it happen. <laughs> How? Uh, what, so what's the reason for you not doing any podcasts, first of all? I'll be very honest. I think a lot of people go on too many podcast runs. And for me, I kind of just got to a stage even a year and a half ago where I was going on podcasts and I was just repeating the same thing again and again. Mm -hmm. And I feel like at a certain point you need to go and like, I don't know, like live some life and like go do something else and yeah. like get some new insights and some new experience in life. And then you can come back and kind of relay and share some of that. Uh, so that was the first thing. The other thing is there was just no benefit of me going on podcasts yeah. and I guess I'm just kind of like a bit of a introvert I usually just like working you know so um I think obviously at this, at the, at this stage your following has blown up yeah. over the past year two years so but st stuff like this obviously you know yeah. no, I'm quite fond it. of you so, <laughs> so you know this doesn't feel like a podcast when did you when did you first uh find out about me I'm curious uh, to know. Oh, okay. I remember. I, I was considering moving to Dubai. I was in Cape Town at the time. Mm -hmm. What year was this? At, end of 2020. Mm. Uh, I was at my place in Cape Town and I was looking at like, all of a sudden it was like during the whole like lockdown, this, that, which I was very vocal about and very against. Mm. And I was just very upset about the whole thing. And I just decided, you know, I'm, that's it. I'm, I'm done with the UK. I'm, I'm leaving. And then start assessing some of my options. UAE came up as one of those options. And then I saw your video where you moved from London mm. to Dubai. And I was like, hmm, uh, okay, this, yeah, this makes sense. And then there we go. Been hooked ever since. <laughs> so I know you've said this before many times on different podcasts, YouTube videos, but for those people who don't know the background of you know where you come from what you've been through you were born and raised in dagestan for at least four years correct and then you moved to london mm -hmm. when you were four correct and then you had some pretty terrible experience with father figures biological father wasn't pretty in the picture much my biological father was an alcoholic abusive mm -hmm. um which i guess I'll call it what it is. It didn't affect me. Mm. Uh, you know, I will be very honest. It wasn't something that has caused me trauma or something that lives with me because I guess it was just kind of out of sight. You know, obviously it's affected my mom very deeply. And my mom's a very like hardcore, strong Russian woman. So she'll tell me like stories and she's, it's funny, like, I get reminders of what she's been through every once in a while, but, but it's just weird because she's so blase about it. Recently, she just had a little incident and she um, a fractured her shoulder. So I was in the hospital with her. And I was like, mom, by the way, you've never broken any bones, have you? She was like, yes, one time when your dad uh, pushed, pushed me out the car while we were driving. <laughs> and, you know, and so it's, but it's just, I guess that's just Russian moms sometimes. They're just like strong, mm -hmm. like Eastern European people are just very strong people and they can just kind of like, they're very blase about things. So for me personally, that didn't really affect me. Uh, my stepdad, my mom and my stepdad started dating. Uh, they met in Moscow. They dated for a year and a half, two years, then child living out in London. Uh, and then eventually he proposed and we moved to London and it was great until it wasn't great. Eventually that kind of got rocky. And yeah, that, that. How old were you at this point? I was eight or nine. Yeah. And basically he cut us off and they kind of went their separate ways. And at that point, I was realized very, very quickly I had to become the man of the house. Yeah. Cause she, uh, 
she was working at NHS. Yeah, she worked. Uh, she worked a couple of jobs here and there. Uh, yeah. She was a receptionist at NHS. So, for anyone who doesn't know in your audience, uh, NHS is the public healthcare service in UK. And I don't know if you've ever been to NHS hospital. I went once, and it's just brutal. Mm. I'm sure as you know, like yeah. you're just there, stuck, waiting for six hours in the emergency room. No one's tending to you. No one's seeing you. So when you're the receptionist, you're getting a lot of abuse hurled your way because there's a lot of people who rightfully are very upset and are very in a very stressed state. So she did that. She also used to work uh, at Harrods, um, so just you know minimum wage retail jobs. Um, and yeah, how was uh, how was school for you? At least like the early years. I I think I, <laughs> I think I had my f first friend when I was maybe nine or ten years old. Like I was always just very shy to myself, uh, even though, you know, uh, people see me online and this and that. I'm naturally very introverted. I can be loud and gregarious and outgoing if need be, but I just like being alone into myself. Mm. Um, That's interesting because you would seem like the last person that I would have thought would go and pick up a camera mm. and start talking to it and put in their life. Out you know, it's it. cause I had no one who I could talk to about that. Mm -hmm. Like I was, I started reading a book a week when I was 14 years old. Now I was always super into reading. Even when I was young, seven, eight, I used to read a lot. But then I read like hardcore self-help business books from the age of 14. So, uh, you know, it, but, well, wh why? I, it's cause I knew I was fucked. Um, like I, I knew from the age of eight or nine years old, I was fucked. And it was, I guess you just grow up so quickly. I remember even my mom used to have to always hide her bank statements because I would be 11 or 12 years old looking at her bank statements and running calculations. How much How much are we spending? Mm -hmm. What's our, our run rate? And my mom's always been super frugal. Even to this day, she's still super frugal. You know, as I said, just being a youngest of seven growing up in the uh, Soviet era, she, she's always learned to be resourceful and frugal and this and that. But, you know, I would be 11 or 12 years old and I would be looking at this stuff and I'd be running calculations and it was just very clear to me, like we are royally fucked. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you know that, and when you're the only child, especially of a mom who's single mom, who's out there working and trying to make ends meet, listen, it's not like we were homeless or anything like that, but it's still, you just don't want to see your mom in that place or in that state, especially as an only son, an only child. So yeah, I guess I just got sucked into the world of self-help and self-development. And the thing is now, if you're 14 and you do that, it, it's so crazy how quickly things change in the world. Because 10 years ago, that shit was whack. If you were 14 and you were into self-development, you were a weirdo. You were like an outcast. Whereas these days, if you're 14 and you're into self-development, you're praised. Like people respect that. They respect you for it. So the reason I picked up a camera was because I, did, I had no one to talk to. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that's, I guess that's what's very unique about my position is you can see me going from, there's literally videos of me it's, when I'm- It's literally ridiculous. I went and watched a few of them <laughs> and it was like day in the life of a bodybuilder. Yeah, I was, <laughs> I was super into like fitness back then. Uh, you know, obviously I never took it as far as you. Um, yeah, maybe if I had uh, your training plans back then, I, I could, you know, I could have taken it a little bit more seriously. But uh, yeah, I, I was 15 years old. It, it's, it's crazy because I have eight years of footage on YouTube. Yeah. And I was uploading on YouTube for so long just for myself. Like I had years and years of me just documenting everything from, okay, I'm reading this book this week. So I'm reading this book. Uh, this is what I'm doing in the gym. Uh, this is what I'm going through. Oh, I have this business idea. I'm starting this business mm -hmm. uh, all the way to like me signing my first client. Uh, and then going through a long drought where I wasn't signing any clients. And then I signed my first big client and then a, a, a week later, I was making five, five and a half, a half grand a month. Within two months later, I was making 15 grand a month. Then I hired my first employee. And then three days later, I make a video of how my first employee left because he thought I was basically just such a shit leader. <laughs> because I was 17. I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. It's it's so good, though. Like If there's one thing I regret, it's that I didn't start sooner. Mm. I started uploading. I think my f the, the first upload was in 2016, mm. which is when I was... I was 26 mm. and already at that point I'd been training for so many years. I hadn't, I, there was two competitions I did, didn't film any of that. 
opened up a gym, didn't film any of that. There was like so much of my life, which I didn't document, which mm. I can only really go back and check some Facebook pictures and maybe early Instagram pictures. Like I'm so annoyed I don't have that footage. So you- Yeah, but you, you can be annoyed, but also it's, you know, uh, I think it, 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 it was different back it then. Was, it was just different. Like yeah. there was nothing cool about that back then. Yeah. You know, now it's like all of this stuff is glamorized. All this stuff is cool. Whereas back then it's like, I'm sure, you know, even in 2016, I even had, I was filming in the gym in 2015. I felt like ashamed. Mm. Like I felt genuine shame. Like I felt like I was doing something wrong. Yeah. Or I would like put the tripod down on the street and like talk. And like, I felt like I was like breaking the law or something like that. Yeah. So, so things have really changed. So, you know, you can't really kick yourself for that. Yeah. I, I remember there wasn't even uh like selfies weren't even a thing. Mm. The first three years of my gym training, I did not take one picture inside of a gym because it just it wasn't a thing. The mm. phones weren't really that good anyway. And then even if you did take a picture, where were we going to put it? Mm. My space. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I had to go back and look at some like holiday pictures to try and piece together, you know, my 10 year transformation. Mm. So the game is definitely different compared to how it used to be. It's a very different world. Your your early sort of business mind and money making schemes. I, I read somewhere that you did uh, you were you were buying and selling Instagram pages, Correct, growing yeah. them and selling them. Yeah. When I was fourteen, what else were you doing? That was the first business. Uh, so basically, once again, I, I guess YouTube was a second evolution. YouTube at first was just like a diary to myself, mm -hmm. and before that, a year and a half, two years before that. I had an Instagram page. It's actually still on Instagram. It's called Fakuk the Norm, F C U K the Norm, for obvious reasons why it's called that. Uh, and up until maybe like maybe like the last fifteen or twenty posts aren't me, but everything before that, you could, if you, anyone wants an insight into what I was thinking when I was fourteen years old, you can go to that page. I wrote every single caption on that page, and I grew that page to I think it was thirty or forty thousand followers within six months, mm -hmm. and. All of a sudden, one day I get a message from a brand and they're like, oh, how much do you charge for a promotion? And this is around 2014, this is around like the movement era, you know, where brands are starting to realize, oh, there's these pages and these, these uh, influencers and we can pay them and we can make a great return. And that was what I got sucked into the world of Telegram groups where people are buying and selling promotions and buying and selling accounts. And that was basically the first thing I did. I started selling promotions, mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, uh, Instagram promotions for that page. And then I was starting to get offers to buy that page. Mm -hmm. So I took uh, the money I made from promotions. And what I would do is I would buy a, an Instagram page, let's say for like a Porsche fan page. And I would take that Porsche fan page because that's a very niche thing that you can't really get many sponsors for that. And I would take a Porsche fan page with 150,000 followers, which back then was a lot worth a lot more than what it is today. And I would just rebrand it to a general luxury page. And, you know, I'd lose a decent amount of engagement and followers, but at least the page was open to a lot more uh, sponsorships and uh, potential sponsors. And that's what I did. I just flipped Instagram accounts and then eventually I ended up selling that first account. Um, I remember in the early, in my early 20s, I, uh, I, I paid for a couple of shout outs on these bodybuilding Instagram pages because that was the thing back then. I remember Instagram bodybuilding was like one of the biggest ones. And this is when reach was like, strong mm. like you were getting a lot of engagements on the reaches and you could pay it well, varied in the early days wasn't that much but then they started charging more and more so all these fitness people because there was a lot fewer people on the fitness space and instagram they would pay instagram bodybuilding to feature them and then you would get a couple thousand followers like organic followers from them and that was like a that, that was a business back in the day mm -hmm. now it's obviously completely changed but yeah and that's kind of what happened very quickly within it was within six to nine months of me getting into that. Mm. It was just everyone kept undercutting each other and mm. prices just of what people were charging, of what the accounts were worth went down so much uh, that I saw the direction it was headed in. And I just knew that it wasn't really, it wasn't like a real business. Mm -hmm. It wasn't something tangible. Did, did you did you notice at an early age that you had a particular strength that where you're like, okay, I'm good at this? Not really. I, I I wish I could say I was one of those kids when there I, must have been something though. Yeah, but I wish I could say I was one of those kids who was like, like who was like seven do, with a lemonade stand. But I wasn't like I wasn't one of those kids that went to like went and brought candy to school and sold it to people. But you, you you understood social media. I, I don't. I wouldn't say necessarily I understand social media. I think I'm just a very like logical person. Mm -hmm. I think people are just very emotional in their decisions. I'm very logical, 
and I'm very, I can pull emotion out of something and look for th at things for what they are. And I think that's why I've done so well in life because as you continue to grow in life, probably the biggest hurdle you're going to face is managing people. And managing people is all about removing your emotions and removing, you have this idea of who you want someone to be and who they actually are. And those two things aren't the same mm -hmm. a lot of times. So I wouldn't say that I'm naturally gifted at business or this or that. I think it's just when you go through, when you go through tough, a tough upbringing mm -hmm. and you go through an upbringing where you have to see reality for what it is. I think I had from such a young age, I had to see reality for what it was, not a uh, clouded picture, per like this is reality and you have to face reality. And when you know how to face reality and you know how to not run away from things, you're a very, very powerful person. And you can go, you, listen, you can have any university degree, you can have any this, that, it doesn't teach you critical thinking. And it doesn't teach you how to look at situations and look at real world problems and figure out, okay, I'm fucked. How do I unfuck myself here? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I definitely wouldn't say I was a born business savant or anything like that. So what happened when you, you reached the age of 17, you decided to drop out of school? Correct. Why? Because I was making like, 20 grand a month and I had an this employee for this was doing which uh, at that point I had an agency. Okay. So after I was doing the Instagram accounts from there, uh, I said, I saw the way that it was going. I made decent money. It must have been 10 grand, something like that. Mm -hmm. Enough that I felt very rich at 15. Uh, and then I just got really into fitness, like mm -hmm. super into fitness stuff. Uh, and you know, I was trying all different things, conjugate methods, squat every day, uh, all these different splits. And, you know, I was learning the difference between, uh, you know, your thoracic, your cervical, you know, learning body anatomy and stuff like that. And I would just bite off my friend's ears, uh, and my friend's parents ears. And I would basically just hustle my friend's parents into paying me 20 pounds an hour. And I would just sell them monthly packages. And back then that was like, you were a personal trainer. Yeah, bro. At 15. Yeah, <laughs> Damn. super qualified. But um, yeah, I think my friend's parents just respected the hustle and respected that I had initiative. Mm -hmm. and I may have not been the best personal trainer, but actually well, uh, being a personal trainer, you learn you learn some yeah. good skills doing that, yeah. like how to communicate with people for sure, how to you know motivate them, get mm -hmm. results from them. Yeah, it's a it's a good skill to have, and doing it at fifteen is pretty cool. But yeah. how how do you do that when you were at school at the same time after school? Yeah, no, I, I, I've i always been a workhorse. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah, the workhorse stuff, that, that's never been an issue. Mm. Um, so that led me into, I'm watching all these fitness influencers mm. and I'm like, yo, you know what? Why don't I just pick up a camera and just start vlogging my life? Mm. Like start making videos and, you know, they would get like 13 views, but I didn't really care because it felt like someone I could talk to. Because as I said, back then, the self-development stuff, it wasn't cool. You were, you were legitimately lame. You were an outcast. In school, I was a full outcast. Mm -hmm. I was lame. Like everyone laughed at me. And the acne was very strong as well. Acne was also very strong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's rough. <laughs> uh, it was probably like fucking all the protein shakes. All the, <laughs> yeah. Cause you know how the diet is back then. Diets like as m stuffing as many carbs as you can, dirty ramen. Uh, um, I remember, um, Tesco used to have a, you could buy three packs of uh, Reese's cups. So three packs, nine, uh, nine Reese's cups for one pound 20. Mm. And like I, I, all I've viewed food back then was, was just calories. Yeah. I didn't give a shit. Micronutrient, macro, I didn't give a shit. Like if, if, just calories. Yeah. Um, Cause also I have Russian genetics. So like, I'm, I'll be very honest. I'm one of those people I can eat anything. Nothing changes. Mm -hmm. Like I will not gain fat. Yeah. It just doesn't happen for me. Um, that cheap protein powder will mess you up as well. <laughs> bro, it, fucks, it fucks you. Your, your, your bowels, your skin, everything, bro. Yeah. <laughs> so at, at what point did you decide, oh, well, this is fun, but this is not for me? So I was doing that. I had a YouTube and I was kind of honing in my craft of photo, video. And then from there, I just started reaching out to people and saying, yo, I'll give you a free video shoot. I'll make a little video for you. I'll do a photo shoot, stuff like that. And then that's how I started getting some photo video clients until the day where one business was like, can you do this for us? Like long-term. I was like, what do you mean? And they're like, like, could you like manage our social media and like create content and post it and grow it? And I was like, yeah, sure. And I sent out my first quote, which was 
<laughs> it was, I was so scared to do, first of all, I charged weekly because I thought that might sound cheaper. Mm -hmm. And I also charged, I was too scared to charge 100 pounds a week. So I charged 95 pounds a week. Um, smart. smart. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't see through that at all. Well, actually, I guess they didn't because they ended up signing. Um, <laughs> and that was my first client. That was in August of 2016. Was it a thing back then? Social media management and marketing? Yeah, I remember back in that year, I think 2017, it started to become a thing. But when I did it, like I didn't, I didn't know it was, I didn't view it as like, oh, I have a mm -hmm. social media marketing agency or whatever. Like for me, it was just, because it wasn't really that. Mm -hmm. I was just a service provider. That's it. Mm -hmm. Like at the end of the day, if you, you can call yourself a business owner and this and that, but if you are a solopreneur, you're just a glorified contractor. And by the way, there is nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. You can make, you, you can easily make 10, 15, 20 grand a month as a glorified contractor, but you just can't really call yourself a business owner. Yeah. You know, you can't yeah. call yourself an agency. There's no agency. It's just you, yeah. you know? Um, but didn't matter. Yeah. You know, I started my agency at that point and was it, so you, you had that first client you start taking on more people. And I then tried. You thought, I tried for seven months. Nothing worked. Really? No clients for seven months. So you just but had one? I had one client, 300, 380 pounds a month. And if you took the amount of time that I was actually working, uh, or what I was getting paid divided by the amount of time that I was working, I was working below, like two pounds <laughs> <hours>. <laughs> below minimum wage. I was doing 30 Instagram posts, 30 Facebook posts, all unique. Yeah. 30 Instagram posts, 30 Facebook posts, and also managing their Snapchat which meant I had to physically be there. Um, what a great deal for you. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about it. Uh, and then the next client I signed, I signed a client seven months later. Uh, and it's so crazy because it's, I guess, come so full circle with them. Uh, the next client I signed was Gemflow. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I signed them and that was 1,900 pounds a month. Um, how, did and, you, how did you wing that? That's pretty, that's pretty good. I don't know. Because Genflow, when I, my first uh, introduction to Genflow was the Athlete app. Really? That was the first uh, platform where I could host my programs in an app form. Mm -hmm. So when I started working with them, like that was for me, it was a, it was a very good money maker because mm. you could just scale it. I had no idea what Genflow was. That was my yeah, that was my first client uh, or my first big client. Uh, and then uh, two days later, I signed an or three days later, I just signed another client for fifteen hundred. And then the next client, I think, was 750 or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of how life goes when but it rains. At when this it rains. point, you, you're not doing that all by yourself. All, all by way. yourself. Really? All by myself, yeah. How old are you? 17. Okay, so it makes sense. Yeah. Fuck you, school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've got work to do. Well, no, at that point, it was, I said it was like five grand a month mm -hmm. or five and a half, something like that. And that's fine, but that's not like drop out of school territory fine. I think... You, the, uh, the point at which I dropped out of school, I was making 15, 20 a month. But that was also six weeks later. Yeah. Like the things in life, when it rains, it pours. Yeah. And that goes both ways. When things are shit, they're usually very shit. Mm -hmm. And when things are shit, it's not one thing. It's usually multiple things stacked on top of each other. Mm -hmm. And when things are good, you're on top of the world because usually multiple good things happen in a row. And yeah, that seven month drought period for me it was... I think it's very funny and I try to, I get accused sometimes people are like, oh, you, you know, he's telling people get rich quick and this and that. And sometimes I sit here and I wonder to myself, are you listening to anything I'm saying? <laughs> like, do you actually even listen to anything that comes out of my mouth? Because all I've done over the years is try to tell people, hey, it's going to be slow, but what's your fucking other option? Yeah. And the the main cancer in life right now and the main cancer in the world is social media because the thing is, I, in that seven month window, I wasn't watching, like there wasn't really that content back then. I wasn't watching kids signing clients and making 10 grand a month or 20 grand. Like there was no comparison. Yeah, I didn't yeah. feel any shame. I was like, yo, I'm making 400 pounds a month. This is sick. I'm like, I'm, and I'm trying for more. Mm -hmm. Like I was like, I was so happy with myself. I was so proud of myself. Like you're doing something and it may not be, I didn't, I didn't give a shit what someone else was doing, I was just proud of myself. Mm -hmm. And by the time that things scaled up, it was, the reason I didn't quit in that seven months is because I didn't look around. I just looked at myself and I realized, listen, I gotta be patient. This stuff takes time. This stuff takes time to learn these skills. And also, what's my fucking other option? Yeah, imagine if you'd given up and be like, oh, I'll just stick to personal training. Yeah. Would have been a very different life. <laughs> <laughs> so you persevered and it was obviously well worth it.
Um, after that, where did it go? Do you just continue to, you dropped out of school, you continue to focus on that agency? Yeah, so continue to grow the creative agency uh, until a certain point. So the inflection point was six months later where I was working with these clients, but they saw no value in it. So I was getting decent retainer, I was making decent money, mm. but I'm, as I said, I'm a very uh, unemotional person when it comes to business. So I look at things for what they are and, and I don't get emotional about it. Whereas clients can get very emotional sometimes. They can go, you know, I, I had clients of mine who were spending 10,000 pounds a month on red bus ads, but then they were like trying to like constantly on my neck for the 2,500 pounds a month I was charging them to manage their entire social media and grow it. And, you know, create all of this content that they could use a hundred different ways. And it got to a point where it just got on my nerves so much that I was like, fuck this, I'm done. Mm -hmm. I need to change things up. I need to pivot. And that's when I started learning advertising. And that's when I decided, okay, I'm going to start offering advertising services. I'm going to start offering advertising services to my existing clients as a, you know, as a small fee on top of what I was already doing. So just like Facebook ads. And Facebook ads, yeah. And, you know, that's when I scaled to 100 grand a month. No, I'm just kidding. What actually happened <laughs> is I lost like fucking 70% of my business because the issue was I was so shit at ads that not only did I lose them for the ad services, but I was, either way, I was charging very small amounts to do it because mm -hmm. I was upfront with them that, hey, I'm just getting into this. But it wasn't that, they looked at that and they were like, okay, he can't offer the ad services. They just looked at it as, okay, he's just shit at what he does in general. Whereas they had, you know, they were clients for six months before that, very happy with the other core creative services, mm -hmm. but I got dropped for both. So that was a rough period where I had to basically just learn advertising. And that was the first time that I really started to look outward and start looking at contractors and realizing that I didn't just need a full-time employee I could start using contractor arbitrage. I could start using this global market that we have. And the fact that for someone, listen, if I'm, I'm charging at that point, I was charging UK clients, US clients, $2,500 a month, $3,500 a month. And there's people in Brazil and South Africa and Romania and Serbia and all of these places where if I can give them three of my clients and I can charge, I can pay them $300 per month per client. They're making $900 a month and they're in university. They are killing it. Mm -hmm. Like their life has changed. Like they're, they're making the sort of money they would make three years after they get their degree. And they're making that in school right now while still being able to go to school. And that was really my first taste of the global marketplace. And as I said, it was patchy for a few months, but you know, uh, I think it was April, 2018. That was my first 40, 40 or 50 grand month. Uh, and then by, it was October, 2018. I think that was my first hundred grand month. So. Was there a point where you'd hit a certain amount of revenue or profit per mm -hmm. month where like, this is good. Where you felt like, oh, like I've made it. No. And that, same attitude has carried through my entire life. And I genuinely think it's the reason I am where I am today. I've never been interested in making it. That's why I don't believe in the whole like, oh, I made it bullshit because I've seen it time and time again where people make it and they buy their Lamborghini and they buy their this thing and that thing. And they're like, oh, I made it. I achieved the dream. And people don't realize that things decay. Yeah, There's entropy. There's, it doesn't... What you can do is you can buy yourself time. Like if you work really hard for the next six months, you may have bought yourself 18 months, but there's no such thing as fucking passive income. Yeah, The market will do what the market does and someone will come in and take your spot. So I, I guess just from a young age, I've always just realized there's no such thing as like, I'm here now, I'm happy. Mm -hmm. I think there's definitely a monetary amount where you can get to where you realize, okay, I'm kind of happy at this amount, but it still takes maintenance. Mm -hmm. uh, I just, I think I was in such a weird position where I made my first million when I was 18. And when you make your first million when you're 18 and you're also like, I grew up so quick in so many senses of my life. So like 
even when it came to women, when it came to money, when it came to all these things, I grew up so quick and it's, it gave me this perspective that like, for me at least, apart from work and challenge, like what's left? Mm. Like I have so many, listen, I even have friends of mine that have $300 million in the bank and they're in their late twenties and they've done very well in certain businesses. And I'm, I, I have to check in on them because sometimes I, they're a genuine suicide risk because they have all of this money at a young age and they don't know what the fuck to do. Yeah. They're lost. They're genuinely lost. They have no purpose in their life. And when I, I don't say it lightly when I say I, I think that they are a genuine suicide risk. So I have to constantly check in on them, make sure they're doing okay. And that's a person who has the dream. So I think, you know, there's nothing wrong with getting to a point financially where you're happy. And I always try to make it clear to people that I, listen, I'm at a very, and for the last couple of years, I'm at a very interesting point in my life where I take home personally tens of millions of dollars a year. That's not a good life. My happiest life was when I was between the ages of 19 and 20, probably those two years, mm -hmm. I was doing a couple million dollars a year, profit, take home, best quality of life by far. Less stress, less responsibility. Less stress, less responsibility. But it's, you know, I've, I guess I've, I, people always say, oh, I don't do it for the money. But it's like, you get to a certain point where you've just made so much money that you have to ask yourself, why does this person keep doing this? Mm -hmm. It's quite clearly not for the money because they're good. Uh, and I think I would just be bored if I. Yeah, well, that's, that's what sets you apart from everyone else. I mean, if an 18 year old has got to the point where they're making, or they've made a mill, like they're going to go wild. Mm. And maybe they'll, that'll be it. They're happy. They just want to go party for a couple of years because, you know, you can certainly have a good time at that age with a million. <laughs> but you. I still did, by the way. Uh, yeah. Make that very clear. <laughs> I, 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 and I still do. I've, I have a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, but I, you, I feel like you do it. You do the work. Once you've done what you need to do, mm. you take a little break, enjoy yourself, and you get back to it mm. straight away. A hundred percent. And I think the, as I said, the thing that sets me apart is I'm very, and some people think this is bad, but I'm always paranoid. I always think what could go wrong. Mm. And for a quality of life perspective, that's not a good way to live. Let, what, what, it, I've got a question for you. Yeah. What are you more paranoid about? Becoming irrelevant on social mm. media and your views, your YouTube views just couldn't give less of a or shit. Or income dropping drastically. Uh, it's paranoid in a different way. What I mean by paranoid in a different way, when it comes to the social media stuff, I'm going to be honest, I, I literally don't give a shit. Like I was making content on YouTube for half a decade before anyone even watched it. Mm -hmm. Like, so quite clearly, I really don't care. Uh, it's not that. And I'll be honest, I actually, it's something I've toyed with a lot. I don't know how much longer I'm going to be on social media, if I'm going to be honest. I think especially in the last half a year, I've something I've really mulled over. And for me, a, a life out of social media is much better. I, I, people need to get that through their head that a life outside of social media, everything in your life becomes very complicated with social media. And I've also gone to a point in life where I have such a, like I really, I mean, like I was 21 when I, when I really never needed to work again ever in my life. Mm -hmm. I had 10 million to my name personally at the age of 21 after tax. And at that point, you're good. Like, I'll be honest, once you have 10, maybe you can push for 25. But like, mm -hmm. once you got 10, like you really are, you're fine. You're good. So it's not so much paranoid in that sense, because I don't, I don't need any more income for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And if the, if the social media side went down, I would kind of love that because then I can mm -hmm. focus on my companies, what I've been invested in and stuff like that. And when you have a certain track record, you don't need social media. Like in order to, if, 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 so if you, let's say for example, your, your social media vanished, mm -hmm. how much would the revenue from the other company, companies and businesses be affected? Well, some companies would be affected more than others, mm -hmm. uh, but also some companies' revenues would go up substantially more because I can focus on mm -hmm. it. Because I have a lot of companies that social media doesn't affect, social media has no bearing on mm -hmm. uh, the performance of that company. And the thing is, I was saying this uh, to my friend the other day, we were talking about some athletes and one athlete is very uh, active on social media and the other athlete is not. 
And, you know, my friend was saying that I know this person will become a world champion. And I said, I'm telling you this for a fact right now, for a fact, this person will never become world champion because you it's can't be a social media, destruction. you can't be a fucking little monkey social media superstar mm -hmm. and still do this. Yeah. Now, in, in that world, that doesn't make sense. Now, if your social media di directly helps you get more business, then that makes sense. And I'll be honest, I was actually going to quit social media 18 months ago. It was my business partner at my software company that talked me out of it. Because my business partner at my software company said, listen, you could drive us so much business through your socials that it would be, you have fiduciary responsibility. It would be so irresponsible for you to not do this. And that was when I finally started taking social media seriously. Mm. You know, I'll be honest. I was this, uh, 2022. Listen, uh, in one year from summer of 2022 to summer of 2023, I grew 2.6 yeah. million subscribers on I, YouTube. I wrote some of the stats down because it was literally, the growth was ridiculous. Cause in 2021, I was looking at social blade. It's a pretty decent website, by the way. Um, in that year, I think from the beginning, you had 161,000 subscribers and finished the year with 180. So growth, 19,000 subscribers in one year. Then we go to June 2022. In one year, in less than a year, you got a million subscribers. And then after that, it just... It was, it, listen, I started taking YouTube seriously in summer of 2020. Summer of 2020 to summer of 2023, I went from 400,000 subscribers to 3 million subscribers. Yeah. And the thing is a lot of people, well, first of all, there's never been that growth on YouTube in history, yeah. in anything to do with fitness or self-development. There's some people that have done it like a vlog channels and this, but that's like, uh, yeah, but you have to do crazy stuff. And that's also like, I, I can't compete with that. You know, the mm -hmm. thing, it, so over the space of the last couple of years, self-development, fitness, all stuff, it's gotten a lot more cool, but it's still not mainstream. Like it's not, no. it, it, not everyone is doing this stuff. So yeah, it's, listen, I don't think the growth is crazy. I think it's the fact that we, I orchestrated every aspect of it. Like there's people who achieve things in life. There's a big difference between achieving something and being able to explain how you achieved it mm -hmm. and why you achieved it. And a lot of times the people who achieve things can't actually break down, I did this, 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 and this is why this happened. What do you think they got lucky or they just don't understand how they yeah, did it? Listen, luck is a big part. Yeah. I would say even the first few years of my business, I was just, a, a large part of it is luck. Mm. You stumble on certain business models at the right time and this, everything in life is, is partially luck. Even when I started doing the fitness videos, I got lucky the time I was doing it. Like if I was to make those videos now, I'm sure they wouldn't get the same amount of traction. Yeah. It was because I was one of the early ones to start doing the the very simple to the point fitness videos. Yeah. Timing, luck. It's it's a part of life. Mm. Simple as that. What would so what what were your tactics and strategies to blow up that YouTube channel? Because I think realistically today, there's so many people that want to have a following, they want to grow their YouTube, their Instagram, whatever it might be. Well, first of all, the, the first thing I want to make very clear to people is I, I want people to ask themselves, why do you want this? Because I, being well-known for the sake of being well-known is legitimately the stupidest <laughs> fucking thing anyone could ever do. Because when you're well-known, there's expectations of you. Mm -hmm. When you're well-known, if, if you're well known enough, you're going to need security. And that's not because you as a person are at risk, but it's just certain things like, listen, most people are lovely, but there's certain places, there's two places I will not take photos. You could stop me while I'm running, I'll take a photo. If I'm at dinner with my mom, I will take, I'm the most like, I will stop, I will go out of my way. The two places, don't come to my house and at a place of prayer. Those are the two fucking places I just want to be normal. Has it happened? What, house? Yeah. <laughs> Go on, Ax. Ax, well, five Tell times, some stories, Ax. Five times, five <laughs> times a day. But people, wait, this is in Dubai. Yeah, no, but people are dumb. Like people, and I've had crazy stuff. I've had people swim over to try to get to my house. <laughs> bro, I've had, you name it, I've had it. And bro, bro, that's in Dubai. You can't believe the shit that happens in, in London, Cape Town, other places. It gets crazy, bro. And who are these fanboys that want to meet you? And these are just, yeah, they're fans. Mm -hmm. And And the other thing that people don't understand about Fame is you could have a superstar athlete, but the thing is you could be like, oh, this is some famous football player. Like I'm, I'm friends with quite a few famous football players and people know who they are, but not as many people will go out of their way 
to go take a photo with them or be like, yo, like you changed my life or yo, you did something for my life. Mm -hmm. Whereas, for example, if you have a, a football player or you've got a, a musical artist and they have the same amount of following, I would say the musical artist will have 10 times more effective fame because you have people who are like, you helped me through something in my life. Mm -hmm. And that's, a, that's actually a very beautiful thing. I think it's what you're known for is very important. And the fact that people know me for, I watched you go from 15 years old, broke and just trying to like start a business to where you are in your position now. And like, I can see the full thing. You've helped me so much. That's a beautiful thing, but also. Yeah, you no doubt you would have inspired millions of people. And that said, I, I don't, I really don't take that lightly. And that's why I don't give a shit what I am doing. I could be anywhere, anytime. And even acts, like even my security team tells me all the time, like, you do realize you don't need to do this, right? Like you can, you can say I'm having a shit day. For me, I think if someone's giving you their time and their attention, like, I just think that's preposterous and ridiculous. Oh, you're just having a shit day for me personally. Mm. But, uh, don't you think if you came off social media, you have a, a duty to these people who look up to you and want that inspiration and guidance? I think yes and no. I also think you get to a certain place where you've helped people as much as you can. And this is also my biggest issue. I think I was telling you this, a lot of people meet me like, or people who actually know me and actually know my businesses and what I operate. They're like, wow, I didn't realize you're actually a really fucking good businessman. Like you're razor sharp. Mm -hmm. And I can't show that on social media. Cause the thing is the things that I deal with these days in my day-to-day -day life these days, at my family office, managing different corporate structures, managing different investments, meeting with the founders and CEOs of companies I've invested in, managing my own internal team, doing all, like stuff that is just very outside of, like I can't take that and help my audience. Mm -hmm. Like this is also why there's a lot of, you know, I was telling you, I was so used to being honest when I was broke. And I was so used to being honest. Like I was honest when I was broke. I was honest when I was making 95 pounds a week. I was honest when I had my first 10K month. I was honest when I made my first million. I was also honest in times when, you know, there was times in my business where my business in one weekend, when my business decreased, uh, we lost 40% of our revenue. And I was honest about that then. I, I made videos about that then. You know, I even have, uh, it was funny enough, it was actually in this building. This must've been like two and a half years ago when I was in Dubai, I, I had a video uploaded my $7 million crypto portfolio. And then, you know, I joked in it, oh, you know, who never, you never know, it could go down, it, you know, next week it could be, it could be 15 or next week it could be three. And here I was making a video two weeks later, it's my, up, my updated 3.5 million crypto portfolio. <laughs> you know, so I've just always been so honest mm -hmm. through this journey that the issue is now I can't really be honest about, you get this weird place where you can't even be honest about how well you're doing mm. or you can't even be honest of like how sharp you are as a business person as an operator because it just doesn't it doesn't help my audience yeah so i get what you're saying if i stepped away from social media it would be i'd be doing a disservice to my audience but at a certain point like how much can you help your audience when you're you're just in a different stage of life mm -hmm. and this is something that i battle with at times because i'm still here making content for people who are starting out because i as you said i do feel a sense of responsibility but at a certain point, do you go? Maybe the type of the content would change over time. Yeah, it could change. But once again, it's just, it would be so not applicable. And I guess I'm also one of those people that I, I really do, when I go off social media, I won't, like, it won't be like a oh, goodbye guy. I will just go. And you, I'm quitting YouTube. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I'm not, like, I'm not one of the, like, when I say I'm going to do something, there, yeah. you won't see me come back six months later. Yeah that will be it. It will be done. And I think there is something quite like, that'd be cool if you took a couple of years off and you came back and then you were just this, this very different, different person. Yeah, maybe, maybe we'll, we'll see. We'll see. You know, mm. there's all stuff I, I toy with. But going back to the original point, what were, what were some of the tactics that you implemented that helped that channel? Listen, blow? there's some stuff that I can tell you off camera. Obviously I'm more than happy it's to give away all the secrets. <laughs> No, I mean, uh, listen, I'll be honest. There's, there's actually stuff that I'm, I really you know, should. The, the one that uh, I liked was the old uh, thumbnail switcheroo. 
Yeah. So, okay. I'll give you an example. That Th- that's one thing. We have three full-time thumbnail editors. Mm. When I say full-time is in everyone in my companies, they're all full-time, so we, full-time people. We don't use any contractors, any service providers. No, hey, you work in my company, another company, any of that bullshit. Everyone works for our companies, like whichever company it is, our companies, and that's it. You're part of us or nothing. Mm-hmm. And I have three full-time thumbnail editors. I've, I've implemented this in 2020, right as we were about to scale up. Three full-time thumbnail editors, and I upload one YouTube video a week. So, and then people are like, that's ridiculous. That's, how does that work? That's, that's stupid. Every upload, every YouTube video that goes out, we have each thumbnail editor has provides five options. So we have 15 options for thumbnails for every single video. And I, I never pose for thumbnails either. Like I don't, like you will not see me like doing a mm. thing. Oh, can we stop and take the thumbnail quick? No, 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 just use whatever images are out there online and make the most of it. So that's one thing that's not revolutionary. But what we did is we would go back and every single day we would rehash an old YouTube video. So we would go back and we would, uh, and once again, there's 15 options. So we would go back and we would AB split test old videos. So I can tell you right now, I don't need to upload for on YouTube for a year and I may not get 10,000 subscribers a day. I think right now it's slowed down. It's a, a little, it's like seven and a half thousand a day average. But if I don't upload for the next year, I will still get 5,000 YouTube subscribers every single day, yeah. day in, day out. Because I just have a backlog of, of videos that I can go back and rehash. So that's just like, for example, one baseline, very simple thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you think that's because the the type of the videos that you have put together, particularly recently over the past two years, they're very, I guess, anybody who is remotely interested in making money mm. is going to benefit from watching it. And they're very, they're, they're straight to the point, no waffle, very well edited, that surely, every, well, first of all, people are more than likely going to watch the whole thing. Mm. They're not going to tune out, which means YouTube is probably going to recommend it to more people. But um, there's just more and more people that still don't know who you are that are probably going to watch one video and be like, oh, let me watch every single one of the videos he's put mm. out. Yeah, it's, it's, it's number one that, and number two it's the fact that I'm so meticulous with the way that I th- do things. Uh, you know, I've never said this, but I, I follow 70-30 split. So 70% of my con- uh, content, I'm not even I don't care if my audience watches it. It's literally just to grow a new audience. Mm. Sometimes like, I'll be honest, it's to the point where if view, like subscribers slow down, I, and it's, I think some people think that I like script my videos or have my videos written for me. The level of attention and care that I put into the video is I write like maybe 10 or 15 bullet points down. Yeah. I'll just, I'll, I'll literally just like think of the video and it's not just the video. You have to find a way to package it and stuff like that. And that's the most important thing is the concept of the video. Cause you could have a, a great video, but you need to find the right, like you gotta think if someone looks at it on the YouTube recommended feed, like why would they click on it? Yeah. Like what is it that stands out about that or benefits them personally? So 70% of my videos is to grow a new audience. And the other 30% of my videos is the stuff that I know my audience loves and would make sure that they don't unsubscribe. Mm-hmm. So I keep that 70, 30 split. The issue is a lot of, and also, I'll be honest, those are the 30% are the videos I really, I genuinely enjoy making, Mm -hmm. you know, I really enjoy doing the event stuff because it's like, it's a full blown investigation into a topic. I really enjoy making uh, like the vlogs or, you know, more entertaining stuff like that. The other 70%, the sit down videos, it's more to draw in a new audience, uh, help educate people. But like, I don't particularly enjoy that too much. So. I think most people put out content and they follow one of two paths. Either you've got channels out there, for example, like, yeah, listen, there's there's channels out there that just only make content for new audience. And that means that their engagement, like if you look at my engagement on YouTube, no one, within a month, every one of my videos gets at least 700,000 views, Mm -hmm. usually a million, at least within the first month. And that's because I'm making content that applies to new audience, but also doesn't piss off my existing audience. Mm. So that 30% of content is there to make sure that the people who are like, mm, the past three videos, it's quite, I've, I've already seen videos yeah. like this last year, or I've seen, and, but then that's one out of every three content, they're like, oh shit, okay, this is why I'm subscribed to him. Yeah. And there's too many people out there that are just making content for a new audience and their existing audience are just sick and bored of it because you're just putting out the same shit again and again. Or conversely, there's people that just want to make stuff for their audience, 
but then you're never going to grow. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that was me for a long time, you know, in 2021, I was just, like, I did not give a shit. Like YouTube was like, it was, uh, you know, I laugh at my team about this. It's because in life, you can't be perfect at everything. You have to pick and choose your battles. And YouTube just was something I did not care about. It really, it didn't affect me. So my, you know, I, I, I sit down with uh, now my uh, uh, chief content officer and he leads a content team of 40 people. And we laugh about how three years ago, it was just me and him. And, you know, I'd shoot a video uh, and, you know, on the day of uploading, we'd be like, oh, so what should we title it? And, and we just like, we'd figure it out in three minutes and then we'd just do the thumbnail. That's what on, I do. On, on the <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mike. <laughs> All right, we, we need to have a chat. Um, and, you know, we, we sit down and we pick the thumbnail on the spot. Yeah. Is this sounding a little too close to home oh, for yeah. you? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, uh, that was basically our, our process back then. Mm. Um, so YouTube is a very, and this is like, by the way, I'm telling you right now, it's like super surface level stuff. The other stuff is, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm more than happy to tell you. On your videos and Instagram, you know, stranger to showing your success mm -hmm. and being like flashy showing you you know the watch collection the cars and things like that is there a specific reason why you do that so do you do that to get attention so people watch the videos do you do it because you want to back up what you're talking about you're telling people how to make money how to help them out if you didn't show them how much you had earned or your wealth then maybe they're less likely to listen to you I think, let me put it this way, with or without social media, I'm going to spend that money either way. Mm -hmm. uh, with or without uh, social media, I'm going to spend money either way. And you just need to look at my spending habits to understand that mm -hmm. I've always just kind of been me. I think like in the last maybe six months, year, it's been cool to wear like dress like a grandpa. Mm -hmm. I've been dressing like a grandpa for years. And I've just, I, that's just me. I've just always been doing that. And you, you know, you've, you've chosen to share that with people yeah but I, it's because so, i'm sharing my life it's not because yeah. i'm specifically manufacturing things i'll give you a perfect example i i've made i made tens of millions of dollars before this year and i bought my first car for personal use in march mm -hmm. i mean now so far this year i bought seven cars because i've got more into it but the point is like what people do when they make their first million dollars is they go buy a supercar mm -hmm. especially if they think that that's going to help them grow their brand you know, my brand was growing massively last year. I could have gone out and bought a fucking Bugatti or a this or a that easily. Mm -hmm. But I didn't because that just wasn't authentic to me. Like, I really just did not give a shit about cars. And also, like, I think the other thing is I moved to Dubai two years ago. When you live in London, having a car is a headache. It's a hassle. And even in London, the car that I own in London is just a black Range Rover. Because I can't, you can't have anything nicer in London. It draws too much yeah, attention. Yeah. It's gonna cause you issues, security or not security. You just there's certain you just don't want to get yourself in certain situations. It's just unnecessary. So I think that's the other thing. Living in London, it was just there's no point to have a, a nice car. It just seemed inconvenient to me, mm -hmm. stuff like that. So, do do you I, have a rule where you will spend a certain percentage of your income, or are you? quite reckless with your spending no no actually i i ran the numbers the other day and i actually figured out that i haven't been sticking to my rule in the opposite sense i was like i need to spend more money <laughs> no i'm being serious like obviously and by the way when i say spend money i'm talking about di like my free cash flow mm -hmm. as in money that i have personally taken out in dividends from my companies mm -hmm. uh if a company like you know i've had for example one of my software companies has done incredibly well mm -hmm. in the last 18 months but we keep all of our money in the company. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't mean that I can take the money out and this and that, et cetera, et cetera. I'm talking like responsible dividends, free cash flow to me or from investments uh, that I have to spend a certain percentage of, which is 30%. Mm -hmm. So spend 30% and the other 70% gets saved uh, and invested. And yeah, I actually ran the numbers the other day and found out that I've not been spending enough. Is that why you've been going to the jet office <laughs> uh no i'll be honest the jet is it's always been a dream of mine like to buy a jet do you uh, think do you think it could be one of those things where you get it and you're like yeah i don't want a jet anymore no i'll be honest we ran through the numbers and i actually i watched it and i think 
if if you were to charter it out full time, you would only make a loss of four hundred grand. Four hundred grand a year, correct. And then obviously the twenty five odd million for the jet itself and the depreciation on the jet. I can't imagine you chartering your jet though. Uh, me, yeah. no. Would you listen, do that? Uh, listen, I'll be honest. I've letting little kids run around your jet. You know, ever ever since I kind of grew a lot on social media, I, there's certain stuff I really have refrained from talking about. But like, there's properties I own that I use, but I also rent out. Because the way that I view things is, I don't view things as how much money did you spend on something, mm -hmm. or in terms of fun assets. I don't look at how much money do you spend on it. it like. It doesn't matter. Listen, someone could spend $50 million on an asset. And if they are guaranteed to return back $50 million, like guaranteed, mm -hmm. that's the fire sale price. Then it's not irresponsible. They're not spending money. They're just parking money. Yeah. So, you know, I have some of these assets where if I was just to buy it, like some, some of my properties, if I was just to buy them and just have them sit empty, that's irresponsible. I need to look at that and go, am I being kind of dumb here? Could I just, mm. in that point, might as well just rent. And you don't have all that money tied up. Uh, but I feel comfortable buying these properties in nice locations and getting to use them because the other time they're rented out. So I kind of view it as like I'm making a bit of money and I get to basically have yeah. these fun toys and villas and houses and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So that was my thinking going, or that's the idea I wanted to explore going into jet business. Now, he's an absolutely great guy. And I actually know him, not from social media, I know him because... Uh, funny enough, my assistant Amara is family friends with him um, and his family. So yeah, there was a connection through that. Uh, so I think he was, just, he was just very honest with me. He seems like quite a, a yeah. straight shooter. And he told me, he's like, listen, it doesn't matter how much money you have because of your traveling patterns and how much you fly, it will never make sense for you to have a jet ever. Like I, he's like, I personally do not recommend you ever buy a jet. Mm. Now here's the thing. There was... When I had no money, I always used to tell myself, I will never buy a new car, ever. You know, I'll always buy a car with at least two, 3,000 kilometers. You get to a certain amount of money, I've only bought new cars. Yeah. Twin, all my cars are 2023 20, brand new. So sometimes, you know, you have an idea in your mind of like, this will never make sense, but you also just get to a certain point where you just want the fucking smell of fresh Alcantara mm -hmm. and you want to know that no one else has used this thing before you. <laughs> so... uh that's all to say that as it currently stands, it does not make sense for me to get a jet whatsoever. Uh, it will never make sense for me to get a jet, but you know. You want a jet. I want a jet <laughs> and ho hopefully I get to a point where it's just, it doesn't fucking matter. Yeah. Who, who gives a shit? If I lose, you know, a million and a half a year on a jet, who cares? The people who say that a jet is a waste of money is the people who don't have enough money to waste. Yeah, it's, yeah don't worry about it. Yeah. It's, it's not for you. So you 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 dabble in a bit in property, but you don't really talk about that too much. Yeah, that uh, when you have a large social media following, you, you get some big issues. Yeah, it can lead to big issues. Uh, so a lot of the listen, I'll be honest. <laughs> yes, you don't want to be telling people what well, I bought this property right here. Yeah, no, and it's it comes with yeah. It comes, listen, it comes with a lot of issues. The other thing is because I am some of these properties are getting rented out. It's the dynamic will be different if people know that it's my property. Yeah, I'll be setting up hidden cameras and weird stuff. It's not only that. It's, I mean, that that I'm not worried about. <laughs> yeah. the, the, the scary stuff, I'm, yeah, the, that's not really a concern. It's more so it's just like, it, it's just different. Mm. It, it may attract a different crowd. I'll be honest, my preference is always when I get a call up and I know that a uh, 55-year-old billionaire is staying there with his family for a family vacation. I don't want, mm -hmm. I love my audience, but I, let me put this I mean this with no disrespect. I wouldn't want me staying there. Let me put it that way. Yeah, yeah. As a as a, a, a owner of the property, I wouldn't want me staying yeah, there. I, don't, I wouldn't want anyone having a party in my house because I know what happens at the parties. Listen, I wouldn't want anyone to be. Yeah, just no. <laughs> <laughs> is it as apart from the security issue? Is people knowing that you have a lot of money ever come around to just bite you in the ass, or has it been ever cons associated with that? Uh, in life, it's. In general, it's better for people to not know what you have. And I mean that not only in terms of monetarily, in terms of your abilities. Is This is the, actually one of my advantages is the fact that, as I said, a lot of people don't know how sharp I am in the business world mm -hmm. and what sort of operator I am. And that gives me some advantage because sometimes people count you out, the people that are relevant. Now, the people that you actually get face-to-face -face with, they can kind of see behind the scenes. Mm. So I think it's not only just in terms of a monetary perspective. I think it's all, in life, it's just better for people to 
counting you out except for the ones that matter. Mm -hmm. And the ones that matter, we'll find out. Yeah. So there hasn't been anything particular that's, you know, come back to bite me in the ass, but in general, it's... Where's the place you've been to that you've needed the most security or you've been on edge the most? Been on edge? Uh, Streets of London. London, London, right? <laughs> yeah. London, yeah, London and Cape Town. That's really, I'm, I want to go to South Africa. Cape no, Town. Cape Town's great. You'll have no issues. I used to, listen, I, I had a house in Cape Town for years mm -hmm. and I was walking around with Rolex, you know, Rolex on my wrist, stuff like that, no security. You'll have no issues. Yeah. It's just, uh, yeah, it's just like if, if, if you... I guess, listen, with everything in life, just have your wits about you. Mm. You know, I lived in London. I, I, I think I bought, I was 19 when I bought a Richard Mill. And I was wearing it when I was 19 years old, I was wearing my RM in London. Mm -hmm. No issues in this. Uh, so, and I was wearing nice watches, Patex, this, that, in London for a long time. As long as you're just not dumb, you have your wits about you. So I think all of these places, you'll be fine. Mm. It's just certain places definitely make me a little bit more on edge. London is one of those places. How is uh how so you got your place in Dubai, which you're running. You live with your team or some of the closest members Correct. of your team. How was that? It's I moved into my own place when I was 17 mm. and I was always used to living alone. It's actually been one of the best things to ever happen. Cause I think one issue and I don't know, maybe you can speak to this. In Dubai, I find a lot of my male friends in Dubai who live alone, who are high achievers, uh, end up getting quite, they feel quite depressed a lot yeah. of times because it's, you're in a place where you feel the energy of like, you should be doing something. Mm -hmm. So you're working super hard. It's also like in London, you know, you know, when I lived in London, I would have friends that would just come ring on my doorbell randomly. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh yeah, I was just, you know, going to a coffee shop around the corner. I thought I'd pop in. You don't get that whole vibe of, oh, I just thought I'd pop in here. Yeah. So you don't have people kind of just visiting you because, you know, in London or Paris or wherever, you're just going for a walk and you get close enough to a friend's house and you call them and you say, oh, are you in? Let's let's hang out. You don't get that in Dubai. So I think for me, it was incredible. It was needed. You know, I live with my head of security. Uh, so it was just, it got to a point where it was needed uh, and it just made sense. And I also live with my head of production. So for me, it was just might as well just have it, you know, the people who are most needed in house with mm. me. And it's just, it works well for us. It's like living with your bros. It's perfect. Yeah, and obviously you're getting your work done as well at the same time. Yeah, correct. I experienced um, my first sort of taste of being alone when I, I left Newcastle. I had a, the best group of friends ever, but I knew that I needed to move to London if I wanted to spread my wings and just, you know, crack on with my career. Plus they were never, their vision was different to my vision. So I went to London, didn't know anybody in London. And that was when I kind of just locked myself away in my apartment and just made YouTube videos, which was good for business. There was no distraction. I was just working all the time, but it was lonely. That was very lonely. And I, I don't think I realized how much I actually needed to just go out and interact with people. And I think, I think a lot of young guys have that issue these days where they think, oh, you know what? Screw relationships, screw my friends. Like I'm just gonna lock myself away and work nonstop. I think it's a period you go through, but also you get to a certain point where you did what you said you were gonna do. And mm. I feel like now you kind of deserve to pop your head up and be a normal social person again. Mm. And there's nothing wrong with that. But yeah, sometimes you need to go through those periods of isolation and like for you, if you do monk mode, what does that mean for friendships? I mean, these days it's not much. Uh, I think, so monk mode was something I started doing three, three, four years ago. Mm. Uh, and it was, I mean, it was something I was doing anyways, but I just put a name to it. And I think monk, monk mode was floating around as a term, but it wasn't like what it is now. I heard it loosely here and there. So I just started telling my friends, oh, I'm doing monk mode. And it was a way for my friends to, you know, understand. Like my friends would even be like, oh, oh, are you on monk mode? You know, like offering me a drink. Mm. And like, oh, I forgot you're on monk mode, blah, blah. Like it, it was something that people could get behind. Mm. Be like, oh, okay, I get it. He's like in a period of focus work and this and that. So I'm just a very intense person. 
I like, maybe I make it seem on this podcast like I'm a robot or this and that. Like I, bro, no, I, no, I, you're not I robot, fucking man. party hard. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. I enjoy myself more than, I like to push everything in my life to 10 out of 10 mm. extreme. Cause I like to see how far I can take things. Uh, so listen, I have a lot of fun, but I like to have a lot of fun, but when I'm not having a lot of fun, I like to work mm -hmm. super hard and I like to have those. I, I think it's important as well. Uh, your point in your life, you're 23, man, you have the, some of the best years ahead of you. Hmm. The, the mm -hmm. 20s are good. So the 20s are good. And also, listen, I think especially as a, a man, you, you don't hit your best years until you're like mm -hmm. at least 26, like at least. I would say uh, for me, it was 28. Mm -hmm. That was when I felt like, oh, do you know what? I've actually, I understand life. Like I know how it works now. I'm starting to understand how women work. I'm getting money. Yeah. Like it's 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 good now. And listen, the the world we live in is is savage because, and I think this is, I've said this before. There's a rush for. I think everyone should rush to make five or ten thousand or fifteen thousand a month. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very comf like even eighteen year olds or nineteen year olds that should be an aspirational thing. But I mean, there's like nineteen year olds are rushing to make a million dollars a year. And I think a lot of it is to do with women. They think that that's gonna help them get women. And I really need people to understand that when you're 19, yeah. no fucking woman <laughs> wants you, bro. Yeah. No woman wants you. Mm. Like girls usually don't want a guy below the age of 26. Now here's the thing, of course, you know, if you act a certain way, I was, you know, when I was 17, I was dating girls in their twenties. You know, like I've always just carried myself in a certain way. You just have a certain energy, but, Nonetheless, mm -hmm. when I was 19 or 20 with fucking all these girls, it's not, it's a, it, it's, they don't want a guy that age. Yeah. They want the guy who's 28 or 30. So when you're, you know, 21 years old in a rush to become a millionaire because you think it's going to get you all these chicks, just understand you're, you're competing against guys who are like 30, 32. You have no chance. You're fucked. Yeah. Like you have absolutely no chance. So this is why I always tell guys, I say, if you have that day one girl, ride through it with her. Like if you have that day one girl that's been with you from the jump, I think that's probably the most beautiful thing that you could ever have and either take her on this journey with you or if you don't have that, delay dating. Delay dating as much as you can because it's go make your go make something of yourself first. Mm. And women will always Listen, I know that some women might disagree with this. I've just I've I've seen enough of the world to understand how things are. A woman with one man will act one way and like a tall brat and with another man beyond her best behavior. Mm -hmm. And it's just the way, that, because she understands that one man will tolerate things and another man won't. How dare you say that? It's, it, it's, <laughs> it's just the way the world works. And, and by the way, that's the same thing with men, men between men. Yeah. You know, a man will act in a certain way. There, you know, men will wouldn't even dare being a minute late with one person. Whereas another person, they know ah, it's fine. Like, the, you know, it, it can slide. Mm. So it's just between people. So I think it's much better as a man to build something of yourself. And then you command certain respect and you command certain authority. And especially in today's dating culture, I think as a man, you definitely need authority in your relationship mm -hmm. and you need your woman to respect you. Otherwise, She's got fucking 30 dudes in her DMs right now offering her a flyer to this, this, that place. And at a certain point, if she's like, doesn't really respect you and she feels like you're kind of nagging her, mm. she's out. What, uh, what's your policy then with the ladies at the moment? I'm sure your DMs are getting hit up, but you're a busy man. You focused on work. Uh, I don't even know if you're, you've got your main girl. I don't know if we keep that private. Listen, so I'll be honest. I, in this, in the same way with business, I think with my personal, uh, my personal, my interpersonal relationships, um, I think I could tell people certain things. I could tell guys things, but it just doesn't apply to them. Mm. And I think that was some of my issue with what was happening last year with all of the red pill stuff is guys were saying, you know, you can have, uh, open relationship and she, you know, you can sleep with other girls, but she shouldn't sleep with any, and, or, and she should do this and you can expect this. And they're like saying this publicly to tens of millions, hundreds of millions of kids or yeah, that's what they are. Kids, boys. And it's like, 
why are you telling people stuff that doesn't apply to them? When I come on this podcast, there's so much stuff that I'm, I, 99% of my best stuff, I don't say here because I'm like, it's going to apply to three people watching this. So yeah, what's yeah, the point yeah. of me even talking about it? Like, it, and that's what happened in this, the red pill space last year. They kept talking about all the, and that's why when you asked me this question yeah. of, you know, I could, what I could tell you've, uh, you've matured. You know, like, you, you, <laughs> I've, I've basically just realized there's certain things you just don't need to yeah, say because yeah. it's, just, it doesn't apply to, it applies to 0.001% of the people watching. And if it applies to 0.001% of the people watching, you just probably just no point, Yeah, you know? So, um, <laughs> yeah, long story short. It gets chopped up and it gets views though, but. Yeah, listen, for sure. It, it doesn't go down well. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It definitely gets views. Um, but listen, if I had advice for men, as I said, I think either, for me, there's genuinely nothing better than that day one girl. Mm. And especially in today's day and age, that like day one girl who has been there from the beginning, like you just, you can't beat that. And I think that's like the most beautiful story in today's day and age. I think especially someone like you, I don't know if you could ever find that again. Yeah, it's, listen, it's, it's very, very, it's tough. And here's the other thing for, as a guy, as a successful guy, you'll always have, the funny thing is it doesn't matter what position you get to in life, you'll always, people will always say, oh, but how do you know she's not with you for the money? And it's like, okay, maybe like, maybe it's, I don't know, cause I'm, I'm driven, I'm caring, I'm generous, um, uh, I'm respected. You, you, do you just want to focus on the money? Mm -hmm. You know, cause, cause then I guess you could say the same thing about the women. Oh, how do you know he's just not with you for the looks? It's like, <laughs> but, but women don't get that as much. Uh, yeah. Like guys, it's always like, she how do you know she's just with you for the money? So, uh, but the beautiful thing is, I guess, if you're one of those guys who does have a day one girl, then you can always just be like, well, fuck you, actually. Like, mm. she's been with me from the beginning. Uh, so I think that's that's definitely quite uh, a beautiful aspect to it. But it's tough. It's very, very tough for guys out here. And it's very, uh, there's a lot of good things the Red Pill community did do last year in the sense of like, it's okay to have standards. It's, it's crazy, right? Like it's okay to have boundaries as a guy. It's, just, it's okay for you to not be comfortable with things that your woman does. Mm -hmm. Wow, like what a shocking revelation. And uh, I think obviously that made a lot of like women very triggered last year uh, when that whole thing was going down. Um, you think it's eased off a little bit now? I, I, listen, everything in life is a pendulum. Mm. So when things swing so far this way, and it's every, it's not only just... Uh, the online conversation about interpersonal relationships, it went from like, okay, as a guy, you're not allowed to say anything. Like you're a fucking misogynist if you're not comfortable with your girl being out at 5.30 in the morning in Ibiza. Mm -hmm. Like, how dare you? You're so controlling. <sighs> like, you know, but that was like the level of insanity it was at before. And then it swung so far, which is like, if your girl isn't a virgin, she's a whore. Mm -hmm. It's like, both those things are so stupid. Both the, like, what world are you living in? Um, so it swung so far from this way to that way that I always knew. I, I, I was telling everyone last year, I was telling all my friends, like, it's gonna, it comes back that this will not be cool because it's like everything in the early 2000s, it was all about like looking a certain way, like looking as big and jacked as humanly possible. And then it seemed like it went more into like, athletic bodybuilder, gym shark era. And then now I'm sure you see the thing is like a uh, uh, hybrid athlete. Yeah. Like that's the cool thing. So everything in life always, it's always a pendulum. Things are always- Music as well, music, the trends in music are coming and going. All the way down to phone sizes, mm. you know? So these things come and go and they change. Uh, so yeah, I think hundred percent it is massively died off. I wanted to speak a little bit about the, the charity work you're doing. Mm -hmm. I had a few questions. The first one is why, I, I'm sure you get asked this a lot, but the, you do charity, you're building schools in Nepal. Correct. Why Nepal? I get that question a lot. Yes. Uh, it, it seems a little confusing. Uh, I'll be honest, it's not Nepal. It's more so the organization. Mm -hmm. It's That was one of the funny things I learned in 2019. So when I first decided I would contribute a portion of my company's profits in 2019, I realized, very quickly realized, if you start going to charities and going, hey, I want to donate, you know, a few hundred thousand pounds a year for the foreseeable future, they just think you're money laundering. Like no one takes you seriously. You don't get any calls back. You don't get any, like it's just, it's too unbelievable for them. 
Yeah. Like, unless you're like a big, big, like massive corporation. Mm -hmm. And usually if it's like a big chunk that they just need to like sign off on. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and bear in mind as well, I wasn't going to like Red Cross and stuff like that. Because the thing is there's charity they're, they're you do. business, aren't they? Yeah, there's charity you do to feel like a good person. And then for me, there's like, and bear, bear in mind, there's charity you do like, the, the truest form of charity is you don't tell anyone about it. Mm -hmm. And that's actually most of the work that I do. The reason that I did make it public was because if I felt like it related to my audience, mm -hmm. like there's, there's a lot of things I do in my life for a lot of people. And there's, I have to come to the decision of like, is this genuinely inspiring for my audience? Like for example, I bought my mom a $4 million house you know, a couple months ago. And obviously I was really, in two minds of whether I should put that out. Cause I felt like maybe it would kind of ruin the experience in this land. But I also remember like people know, people will find that inspirational, yeah. like to be able to do that for your mom. So going back to 2019, I needed, the reason I brought that whole thing up is I needed a charity that I'm not just pissing away the money. So that means that you're working with smaller charities. And as I said, when you're going to smaller charities with that sort of monthly or sorry, yearly donation, a lot of them, they just think you're joking or trying to wash money or something like that. So ended up after six months, it was six months of work finding this, uh, ended up finding an organization called Pahar Trust and started work in 2019, built our first school, built school, uh, two schools in 2019. And then since then build two to three, two, three, four schools a year. Do you have Nepal. an input on what they're learning though? Uh, or are just raising an army of, uh, kids who are going to chop up your content and put it out on Correct. all the fan pages. Yeah, no, that's, that's actually my master plan. I'm actually just looking for, uh, your, yeah, for ch cheaper employees in the future. I'll, I'll have them start working at 13. Um, <laughs> no, unfortunately, listen, I have an input in the sense of like, there's certain schools we decided, okay, in this school, does it make more sense to uh, put more money into the IT center mm. or more uh, money into the science department or more money into the library? And I, I have that. I mean, I'm the, I'm the sole donor, so I, I get to basically decide those things. Mm. But I can't come in and be like, yo, you should not learn algebra because it's fucking stupid. Like right. that I don't have, right. you know, a right to dictate. And I also know for a lot of people, they find it very ironic uh, and maybe even a little disingenuous that I am so scathing of the formal education system. Oh yeah, you've been, you're <laughs> cooking up something, aren't you? Uh, you know, I have such a disdain for the formal education system. Uh, and they're like, okay, yeah, that's that's fine. And that's funny. And one of my companies is a e-learning platform that is our- Educate. Our, educate. And our full, our entire mission statement is 10 times the impact on your income for one one hundredth the price of mm. university. So like, I really, I genuinely fucking hate universities. Now I hate, do you hate university more than school? I hate university more than school. Yeah, correct. Cause also you can get a free schooling. Now I know in certain countries you get free universities and actually in some countries you even get paid to go to university. Uh, but majority of universities and also the thing is the people that are going to university or the people who have those universities in those countries, usually even if, you know, they're in a place like, uh, a Netherlands, which from what I understand, it's almost free. It's so cheap. Uh, all the people from Netherlands are still trying to study in the U.S. anyways mm. and just trying to go to U.K. and stuff like that. So I have friends of mine that have gone to the top universities and are genuinely, I look them in the eye and they're like, genuinely, I want to be a leading doctor or I genuinely want to be one of the world's best lawyers. And I look in their eyes and they mean it. And when they mean it, I will not ever say anything further about education or my opinion because they are living their truth. Yeah, yeah. Like that is actually their truth. And that's their dream. And you can never take someone's dream away from them. But that's 2% of people. 98% yeah. of people are there because they want to appease their parents. They feel like they should do, or they don't know what the fuck they want to do in life. That was me. Three years. And I, I remember just walking away from it thinking, what, what the hell was all that about? <laughs> Spent a lot of money. I had a fun time. Mm -hmm. You know, I had the university experience. But what I actually learned, it was just, I did economics and business management. And it was just this bullshit theory. Taught by someone who's never actually yeah. run a business. It's so mental when I think about it's, it. Like it's, even it's, school, you go there nine to five, you have absolutely no say in what it is that you want to learn. Mm -hmm. You just sit, 
this is what you have to learn. Mm. You have G- in the UK GCSEs, then your A levels. You're doing it because you want to go to the university of your top choice because everybody's telling you, oh, you need to go to university. Everybody around you is going to university. So you put all the work in, you revise, you study, you get the good grades, then you get to university, mm. then you're like, that. that's it. Mm. Like, that's why I was busting my balls just to get to university. Mm. And here I am, and it's just, this I don't want to be here. Yeah. No, and it's, you know, the unfortunate thing is the entire system is basically built to create workers. And mm. that's why there's so many emotional triggers, even think all the way down to the alarm bells in American systems. There's so many emotional triggers to have you fall into line, even if you look at the way that uh, the desks are placed. Didn't Rockefeller it, come up with the school correct. system? Correct. The reason why is because they needed more workers. Mm. And the thing is, listen, whatever we tell, whatever we implant into the youth's mind today, in 10 years, in five years, we won't see too much effect on it. In 10 years, we'll start to see m- some effect on it. In 20 or 30 years, it's just, they will believe whatever they've been told to believe. And here's the thing, listen, we can have a long conversation mm-hmm. and there's there's two sides to the conversation about, for example, global warming and climate change. But no one can sit here and deny the fact that these fucking idiots were saying that by 2000, all of Miami will be underwater and then they moved the goalpost to 20, uh, mm. 2010, and then they moved it to 2020, and Miami's totally fine. Mm. And the thing is, kids, I even remember being taught that, you know about climate change and this and that. Uh, you know, Al Gore had a very uh, big documentary. Uh, I think he was running for president uh, back in the mid, uh, early 2000s. And the reason I bring this up is, Now you get all of these teenagers who are like climate change, climate change. And I'm like, where's the climate change? Like, like where tangibly, where's the climate change that that you were told about, you know, that you were told, oh, Miami be underwater. And by the way, I'm not saying that I do or don't believe in climate change. There's both sides of the equation. I don't think anyone can say for a fact, a hundred percent, they've been fully truthful. Because as I said, Miami should be fucking underwater. And the thing is, Miami isn't underwater. And also, these banks would never, ever give loans. You've got beachfront property in Miami that you can get mortgages for. Banks aren't stupid. You think they're going to give you a mortgage if they genuinely, from the bottom of their heart, believe that there is a chance in the next 10 or 20 years that climate change will get so bad that all of those houses will be underwater due to uh, rising sea levels. It's fucking insanity. So anyone who's dumb enough to sit here and go, oh, climate change 100% exists or they're 100% truthful is an idiot. Also another, you know, the people with their tinfoil hats that are 100%, it's a full scam, blah, blah. There's nothing to it. I mean, I don't know. As said, this is why you need to, this is why the youth is so important because they can implant anything they want into the youth's mind and they'll see the, uh, the that will come into fruition and they'll see the fruits of their labor 10 or 20 years later Mm -hmm. so the entire education system is just a propaganda machine that's all really all it's become because it's stemmed from initially hey we just need workers and if we can control the children we're set we're set for life the last thing is that they never really ever teach you about money no what is money but why would they there's no benefit to them whatsoever and it doesn't matter what school you go to it doesn't, they're, they're, they're just not going to teach you that. But it's the, it's and they wouldn't like have the approval most for it. important thing in life almost. Yeah, of course. And that's, you know, I guess without even realizing it for years, as I was going through the age of, you know, 14 to really 18 in that period, I was doing what the old Romans were doing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've always said when, you know, time comes for me to have a child, I want them to follow the same principles that the Romans would, which is you would find a school of philosophy that you agreed with, and you would find a person who had a worldview and taught a worldview, and you would send your children to go question, think, ponder, and learn critical thinking in a school of philosophy that you agreed with. And to me, that's real learning. Mm -hmm. You know, to me, that's real learning. That's real mentorship. You know, everyone talks about uh, mentorship or guidance or this, that, like real guidance. And it's unfortunate. We don't really have that these days in school. Real guidance is having someone that is going to push you and make you really question things, not just going to teach you what they have been told to teach you in a textbook. So the whole thing is backwards. Mm. And you have, uh, you've got a series coming out about this soon. 
yeah, I every once in a while I get very into topic. Uh, yeah, I was because I was, you did the um, the Renaissance series. I did was digital it, renaissance, did, yeah. and then the one after that I did was called the reset, yeah. which was all about world. You ha you have this ability to, you go there, but you don't go too far where you get yourself cancelled. Yeah, I'm. Listen, I know how to, <laughs> I know how to play the game, <laughs> you know, and I know how to. Yeah. I, I, listen, a, a lot of people. A lot of people are, are just very stupid. Mm. You know, they like I've I've really seen this, especially in the last like two years. For some reason, it's become. I guess you watched the, the mistakes that Tate made. Uh, yes, and it, it was wasn't even just Tate. It was even before that. I saw like, for some reason, people had this obsession with self snitching. Mm. I don't know. I don't know why people find it smart to go online and talk about illegal things they've done, or <laughs> like quite clearly just uh, completely ignore any sort of guidelines. Like, you know, you see all of these, like, once again, red pill guys that were kicked off of social media platforms and they th find that unfair when like, listen, I'll be honest, the, the really the only one, if I'm truly honest, the only one that I was genuinely shit scared of was my event, The Reset. That was the only one where I was like, fuck, this is, this is intense. I've gone deep. Did, and, did anyone from YouTube reach no, out? No. We got, we got one channel strike for the trailer of it. I don't know why. But everything else was fine. But that was the one that I was genuinely very, I was on edge about. Yeah. Uh, but let me put it this way. If the videos went down, and actually, you know, first, they weren't really breaching any terms and conditions. But if they went down, I wouldn't, like, start streaming and crying about the fact that, oh, they deplatformed yeah. me and all that. Like, I think at a certain point, if you're going to play that game, you have to be willing to suffer the consequences. And by the way, I've played that game in the past, all the way back to even the COVID stuff. Mm. If you try to go look me up right now, I am fully shadow banned on Instagram. You, if you type in every single letter of my name, of my username, except for one, and it won't come up. I am fully, and for some people, it doesn't you, even come Instagram up. Instagram is growing recently, though. I think it's, it's not as bad as no. it used to be. No, I mean, listen, my engagement is insane. It's to the roof. I, I, I haven't seen many people with love engagement I have, but that's, once again, that's with me being shadow banned. Mm. Instagram is my smallest platform. And that's because of all of the, C19 stuff I was posting for years and years. Yeah. I had my Instagram taken down many times. Yeah. I think they, they have like a, this list of like the, the good people and the ones that are in the bad books. I yeah. think if you get in their bad books, you're always going to be yeah. in the bad books. It, yeah. You're, that lives on your profile. Mm. But the, the point is that when that was happening and when I, you know, I lost my blue tick multiple times, uh, because I, I assumed that if someone's who, because obviously blue ticks are very different now than what they used to be. Oh yeah, they used to be safe back then. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I guess for them, they saw it as if someone's, you know, has authority on Instagram uh, and they're t speaking out all this stuff on C19, which you just were not allowed to do. I was doing it summer of 2020. I was telling people this thing's fucking bullshit. Mm. It's, it's, it's actually ridiculous that people are adhering to this and not critically thinking for themselves. Uh, so, I, you know, I was losing blue ticks. I was getting my accounts taken down. This, I had to fucking go through this whole process to get it back many, many times. But the point is never once in that period did I think, oh, I'm, they're so unfair. They're silencing me. I just knew the game. And I knew that, listen, if I want to do this, if I want to on my own accord decide that this is something so important to me that I will be so vocal about it, then I have to live with the consequences. Mm -hmm. So if I was to ever do something that was too, and I guess maybe even from that, I kind of learned how far you can push it. And I like... I developed a lot of like phrases during that period. Like, uh, for example, I would cough, never cough, puppet cough, masters. cough, 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 puppet masters, a uh, jib jab, you know, like all sorts of stuff. Um, yeah. Uh, what, what would you say now going back to education, a five key or essential skill sets, which are going to get you far in life today, five skill sets. Sales is definitely one of them because it doesn't matter who you're selling to. It doesn't matter if you're selling to clients or you're selling to your boss. You know, at, at the end of the day, th there will come a point in which you need to sell yourself as to why you deserve a raise. So I believe that sales is definitely one of them. Managing people, once again, even if you don't own the company, even if you have people that work in your department or you work with, you need to manage, learn how to manage people and manage emotions. And that is super, super important. Mm. Uh, I would say paranoia, um, 
if you want to achieve uh, supernatural amounts of greatness in your life and excellence, you need to be paranoid all the time. And by paranoid, I mean that who's taking my spot? Who's doing things better than I am? I'm doing well, but I is this really all it could be? If I keep doing this, the same thing for two years, what will that look like? Mm. So I would say paranoia is, is definitely one of the most important things. Uh, critical thinking, just being able to unemotionally look at things for what they are. Not the, hey, someone wants to make you feel bad or someone is trying to shame you for things. Like, how have you come to this conclusion? Not what someone telling is telling you, oh, you're a terrible person. How could you even think against the grain? Or how could you not agree with this thing that everyone agrees with? That doesn't matter. Can you critically think for yourself? So that's that. And the last thing is, I'd say, finances and managing cash flow. Mm -hmm. Like you need to be able to manage cash flow. It doesn't matter if you're working with 20,000 a year or $200 million a year. You still need to be able to manage cash flow and you need to understand where to put cash. And with that comes offense and defense and risk management. It doesn't matter who you are in life. Risk management is very important. And I think that's one of the biggest reasons why, you know, over the years, everything that I've told people to do as a business model and as a way to make money, like I see people out there telling beginners to trade crypto. And I ask myself, you're either genuinely brain dead or you can just like, you have no conscience and you can sleep well at night. How stupid do you have to be to tell someone who has 3,000 saved up from working summer jobs, you know what the best way to make money is? Trade crypto. Because yeah, you know what? Maybe, maybe just maybe the, the one out of every 100,000 people or 10,000 people will get lucky and have that coin that 20 X's. Okay, great. You got $60,000. Mm -hmm. Where do you go from here? Because quite clearly, you don't know how to fucking make money because you just got lucky. And by the way, this is also coming from a person that made close to probably in that period. I put a million dollars into uh, Bitcoin in November of 2020 and rolled into Ethereum, probably in that period, close to $10 million in crypto. I'm not going to sit here and say I'm a genius. I will say I made $10 million in crypto and it was luck. Now, of course, you know, at some times you make some strategic decisions in this and that, but like for the most part, it was luck. That, was, that has no, no affiliation or association to me as a businessman and as an entrepreneur. So risk management is so important. It doesn't matter what position you're in life. Because if you have $3,000 in the bank and you think that, okay, you know what? I'm going to start trading crypto. Yeah, you could make a bit of money, but you could also fucking lose everything. Mm -hmm. And that's why you need to work on businesses and you need to work on things where even if you failed for 12 months, how much damage is that going to cause to you? Because if you go ahead and you buy, and and this is why, you know, it's so funny to me. Some people, times people tell me, oh, why do you recommend, why do you recommend I, we do something if you don't do it anymore? And it's like, because I'm sitting on infinite money, infinite connections, and a massive brand. I, I, I literally will make a phone call and make $5 million. It's at that level now. Mm -hmm. So like, you don't have that. So yeah, maybe you, I'm telling you to do things that I'm not doing, but I was doing them back in the day. And that's how I got to this position that I'm at. So that's really all to say that I think risk management is part of that, is being able to play offense and defense and see that, hey, with your money, I think people should be willing to spend their money. But if you're spending your money, let's say you spend $2,000 on something. Let's say you spend $3,000 on something. You know, let's say, for example, someone comes to even your mastermind and they spend, uh, they come to one of your events or an event, you're speak, uh, 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 event that you're a speaker at or something and they spend five grand. Mm -hmm. I guarantee they'll walk away, at least in that situation, I know that they'll walk away with something that maybe not today, maybe not next month, maybe not even this year, but within a few years, it will make you more than five grand. What's five grand in the scheme of things? Yeah. But if they spend five grand and you put it into some crypto coin or day trading or Forex or all this shit, and you end up with nothing and also no tangible real skills. So yeah, I would say that's the last thing, which is risk management. And how, uh, I was going to say, you mentioned mastermind. How did your recent one go? Was that the first one you ever did? 
Uh, yeah, I did an event. I, for, I, I'm sure we were, we were speaking about it and you were like, nah, I'm not doing masterminds. I'll be honest, for that, for me, that was more than, that was just me. Mm. That, that was for me. It's Maybe some of it has kind of come across in this podcast even. I get so frustrated sometimes that I can't be like, the. I can't talk business in the way that I want to and like tell people like everything I've learned and everything I've put together in my company. Uh, you know, one of my companies, uh, I have what they just, they just won't because where understand. would I put it? Where would I talk about it? Yeah. You know, where would I talk about like the, uh, customer support, you, you know, managing 10,000 customer support tickets a day at a software company. Like I can't, I have nowhere to talk about that openly or freely. And of course you can have conversations behind the scenes and stuff like that, but I really like, this is how I got into this thing. I got into this thing for a, a yearning to share with other people what I'm learning. But I said, because I've gone to a point where I can't really talk publicly on, hey, here's the uh, here's the operations behind sending 8,000 people, new customers that come in in a week, a handwritten note mm -hmm. to 100 different countries. Like there's nowhere for me to really talk about that. So the reason I put an uh, event together was I felt like, you know, I'm just so passionate about education. And I know that the education space, there's so many people that are doing it wrong and I feel like they could do so much more for their customers and for them that I just yeah for me it was more like a itch that I want to scratch to be able to talk freely and put on my big business thinker cap on yeah it looked good it was solid I mean I I try to anything I do I try to make it top tier so hopefully it accomplished that if people want to I'm sure there's so many people that want to just meet you and have a conversation with you how would they go about that do they have to sign up to a mastermind? No, you can't. No, no, also, the thing is with the mastermind, it's you you probably won't get let in. Mm. Uh, so that's number one. Like I'm not, I, I have nothing to pitch or sell anyone here. Uh, when it comes to meeting me one on one, I don't do one on one stuff. I've been offered, I've been offered a crazy shit, fifty thousand, hundred thousand dollars for a dinner. Mm. Uh, you know, even when it comes to sponsorships, I don't take any sponsorships. Uh, we have our. Did, you know, have you ever? Even in the early days of the YouTube, did you have absolutely zero sponsorships? That's and, pretty impressive. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, but bear in mind also with YouTube, like I, I actually had businesses. Yeah. Like the thing is, there's people. I think it would just dilute what you have already. And then when you do too many, this is what people don't understand. If you have too many sponsors, it kind of ruins your brand a little yeah, bit. Yeah, devalues the brand. I mean, listen, our rate, because I still get, you know, my. Um, my team still sent out my rate card. My rate card is $250,000 mm -hmm. for a 30 second uh, ad read. And the funny thing is we've had dozens and dozens of companies because they know, they know that if I'm, if they're the person that gets me with millions and millions and millions of followers and subscribers and this, that, and people know I don't do promotions. So they know how much money they're going to make. Mm. Yeah. Steak. Drake mm. advertises gambling. Mm. So, and no one, no one even bats an eye at Drake. No one, no one, I've never seen a single, and by the way, like I actually love Drake. I love Drake in terms of a, uh, I like studying his career mm. and I like, you know, you, uh, you can have whatever opinion you want on Drake, but for someone to stay relevant that long, whether you agree that you should stay relevant that long, because I think there is a case to be said that have your limelight, have your time. Mm. And as I kind of talked about, I think it's when you're on top is sometimes the best time to go out. I think that's the most poetic yeah, way yeah, to do yeah. it. Uh, but yeah, no one, I haven't seen any bad press or anything about Drake, you know, fucking promoting gambling to tens of millions of people and children and this and that. And, you know, all the streamers and this and that. It's pretty weird when you think yeah. about it. No, but if you, act, and, and here's the business model of it. This is the crazy thing. You get a base and then the way that you make most of your money, lion's share of your money, is you get a split of whatever they lose. Mm -hmm. So think about how fucked up that is. You're promoting something to your audience that for you to make money, they have to lose money. And it's not, that's not only just uh, gambling, mm. that's also crypto. So all these guys who, you know, make all this money with crypto and this, they don't make their money from crypto. They make their money because they have a uh, percentage split of whatever you lose, mm. they get a percentage of that. Same thing with Forex. So it's, um, you know, because obviously they'll uh, advertise, uh, you know, uh, these 10X multipliers, 20X, uh, 20X multipliers uh, using leverage and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So if, if you had to pick three brands mm -hmm. that you would willingly get sponsored by what would they be uh three brands i'd willingly get sponsored by 
or you would like to affiliate yourself uh, with? Patek Philippe, uh, but they don't do any sponsorships. Mm. Um, there's other watch brands I've had offers from of that caliber, uh, but I'm gonna be honest. Loyal. No, the thing is, listen, I wear Patek. I, I mean, I forgot to wear a watch today, but you know, I wear Patek, I wear Richard Mille, I wear uh, mm. AP. I, I like tons of different, I, look, I wear Omega. You know, I, I wear Timex, you know, I, I wear tons of different watch brands, but like for me to publicly only be seen out with a certain watch brand, Patek is the only one that I feel comfortable. Like Patek's catalog is so vast that I would have no issues with that. Uh, so I'd say Patek, uh, Laura Piana, um, and the other one, I don't know, maybe, yeah, I don't know, maybe a car brand, maybe Rolls Royce, but. Yeah, I guess I, that would make sense. It would make sense, but I, I, yeah, I, listen, I, lo I love my Phantom, but mm -hmm. apart, I'll be honest, apart from Phantom, I, I'm not, you know, there's not too many other Rolls Royces that I would personally buy because when I'm in a Rolls Royce, I like to be driven. Mm -hmm. if, if you're driving, I like something a little bit more. Yeah, I'll zip around in my GT3 or something like that. <laughs> so, yeah. Over, over the past couple of years, you obviously, you've been hugely successful. You've documented that. What have been some of the biggest failures or flops or mistakes that you've made? Any ventures? I'd say the biggest failures, listen, I, I don't, I don't think you look at ventures. I don't think ventures could ever be failures. And also, let me put it this way. I've never put money into a company and lost my money. So that's really what I would look at as like a massive failure. Mm -hmm. And I never uh, put my money into a product where there might be bumps along the way. Don't get me wrong. Like even, you know, my main software company, it was shaky for some time. Like, cause we didn't take on $20 million in funding. I self funded the entire thing mm. until it was profitable. So it's, you know, we, we didn't have the ammunition that some of these other software companies did. So for a long time, like I looked at the software and I was like, it's not where it needs to be. And I'm not, but these things take time. So of course there's been companies where the product for some time isn't where I would want it to be, but eventually it gets there because we keep trying. Uh, so I wouldn't ever say that there's been ventures that have been failures because they've all ended up after some time becoming successful. I'd say my biggest failures have always been when it comes to people. Because no matter how sharp I am, and I'm very, very sharp when it comes to understanding people and team, every once in a while, there's that one person that slips and you just... It makes you question yourself. You're like, fuck. Like I was. How did I not see that? Yeah. How did I not see that? And it, by the way, this doesn't mean that a person like, I think when I say that people think that someone fucked you over or stole from you or, but I don't, I don't mean stuff like that. I just mean like, maybe you were so set on, listen, there's people that you know will be around for a year. There's people, you know, they'll be around for three years. There's people in my company that I know for a fact will be around for another 18 months. I know that for a fact. And there's people I know that will be around for 18 years. And I'm very good at differentiating the two, but every once in a while you get blindsided. So I would say for me, my biggest failures is more so uh, people or assumptions about the market. Like sometimes I've launched uh, products or we've pivoted pricing. This actually happened. I've been, you know, in a very, I've been having a lot of meetings at uh, my main software company. Uh, recently about pricing. We made a pricing change. We made a pricing change around six months ago that was my call that was the bit long story short was a horrible move. It was it was at that point that our growth stopped in MRR. And now here we are tail between our legs moving back to our old pricing. So you know sometimes you make mistakes like that, but I wouldn't say that that's a catastrophic failure. It's just yeah, it's learning lessons. And sometimes you got to take things to the market and see how it reacts and see what the consequences of what you think are correct. And yeah, sometimes they turn out not to be. Do you ever feel like you wake up some days and you just think, holy shit, like I have so much responsibility to make sure that everything is still ticking along, the businesses, paying staff salary, things like that. Correct. And I th this how, is how do you deal with that? I This is why I always tell people like, don't, go for my life. Like I'm saying this on camera right now. If you want a, the best quality of life, live like Mike, don't live like me for a fact, mm. because as you said, I wake up and there's this thing and there's that thing. And listen, of course I have amazing people in my corner 
And there's a lot of stuff that I just never have to tend to and I never deal with. You know, there's a lot of corporate stuff that I'm, luckily I have great people in my corner. I don't need to worry about a lot of things. You know, there's a issue with what are my assets from my properties? You know, I have people that work for me that have power of attorney. I don't, I don't get that call. I don't have to worry about that shit, but you still know it's there, mm -hmm. you know? And that's why there's like, there's no such thing as passive income or there's no such thing as, you know, uh, it doesn't matter if you have a, you know, uh, a family office and a, uh, a property manager and this and that, there's no, like, there's no such thing as you just buy apartments or properties and they just like, they don't give you any headache. It will always give you some headache. Yeah. So that's really all to say that I am very aware that I have a high stress tolerance and some people don't. And because I know that I have a high stress tolerance, I'm willing to take on more things than other people would. And I'm willing to push push things farther than other people would. So you're 100% correct in saying that my quality of life is, and I'd say definitely this year, my quality of life is the worst it's ever been uh, because of not only the business, but social media. Like sometimes I hear people talk to me about like, oh, you know, the social media stuff's so hard. And I'm just like, I have zero fucking empathy for them. Cause I'm like, I've broken every single record mm -hmm. when it comes to this pocket of the internet. I've broken every single record that you could ever break and not slowing down. Cause a lot of people come up and they come down and they're gone. My numbers have stayed the same. Well, you've even got to the point now where people are making videos and using your name just to get views on their video. Yeah, but uh, you know, as I'm not, I'm never emotional about that stuff. Cause it's, I get it. It's just, it's, you know, it's cheap shots, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's the way the world works, I guess. But, you know, as I was saying, it's pushing social media to a big level takes a toll. Pushing business to a big level takes a toll, but I'm also not a business social media and that's all I do. I have a personal life like, and I, I live a really fucking fun life and you know enjoy myself so to push the and also even athletically mm -hmm. you know i do crazy shit like running three marathons in a week in three continents so you know i think all of those things combined it's it's definitely a lot on the plate but for me i wouldn't want it any other way mm -hmm. do you think in the future you'll move away a little bit from the social media and just focus more on the business yeah 100 percent yeah, definitely. As I said, I think it's a uh, social media makes sense in a time and a place. And I think social media, either it makes sense for your business, uh, which at the moment it makes sense for the business. And as I said, most of the businesses that I have don't, social media has no direct correlation on it. And also I don't really promote ever. Like if you go look at my Instagram, I don't yeah. promote, I literally sell something twice a year. That's it. Mm -hmm. There's two weeks in the year that I sell. The rest of the year, I don't sell. I don't do any sponsored posts. I don't have any links in any bio. Go look at my YouTube videos. There's do you have links in the bio? Bro, go look at my YouTube videos. Damn. Go look at my YouTube videos. You will not find one link on a YouTube video, except for those so the uh, two times a year that I sell, that I actually tell people about my product. Uh, apart from that, go look at my YouTube videos. There's no links, not a single link. No buy my shit here, nothing. And I think that's also why I've had such good longevity. You know, I have conversations with people and they tell me, I'm, I'm very aware that I could make, even though I'm, I'm very blessed and I make more than enough money. I make way more than I need. I, in terms of business from social media, I genuinely, I can say this from confidently from the bottom of my heart, I leave $50 million a year on the table mm -hmm. because I don't promote or I only promote twice a year because I'm not fucking in people's face all the time. But that also, I'm willing to do that because I know I want to have a long, I want to have longevity in my career. And, you know, I'll tell you off camera, I think it's weird to like name drop and shit like that. But the celebrities that are like raving fans, I'm talking the best athletes in the entire world that are raving fans that hit up my DMs. And it, it would, I know it wouldn't be like that if five times a week, I'm like, yeah, guys, so buy my this thing or buy yeah, my yeah. that thing. And when I do sell, that's the other thing. When I sell, I try to make it entertaining. Like I try to like, at least like spice it up or try to, yeah, make it fun for people. So, um, yeah, for for now, social media makes sense. But at a certain point, I think it's it's definitely something you have to step away from. Mm. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to be like some of these YouTubers who've been on YouTube for fifteen years <laughs> yeah. and, and they're just just trying to stay relevant. Yeah. yeah, yeah. At a certain point, I, I think it's also it's with football. Even I see certain football. Sometimes I look at footballers and I'm like, I know it sucks to retire at thirty five, and I know you love this game, but you would just be the biggest fucking badass if you just 
pull the plug now. Yeah. Like if you're like at the top of your game, but you know what direction it's going in and you pull the plug, I just think that's like the most like baller thing ever. What's uh, what's the plans for the next couple of years then? Listen, I don't know. Things always change. Uh, you know, for me, I definitely want to continue to grow my companies. Um, and I'm not, I'm a very good businessman. I'm not where I need to be in the sense that I wake up and I have a lot of things on my plate. But for example, I still look at people who have, I have friends of mine that have 400 companies. And I, I genuinely, I, I scratch my head and go, how the fuck do you manage all that? I don't understand. Like all of these corporate structures and this, like I, I don't get it. Mm. And that's the next learning that I have for myself is going even deeper into that world. Because the thing is, once you are well-known, and you have a track record in business and you have capital you're and you have time it's very unlikely you don't hit a b you would have to be a real idiot not to become a billionaire mm -hmm. if you have a track record you have quite a lot of capital and you have an audience deals just fall in your lap equity falls in your lap you get the best of best offers because people would rather work with you than some other random company that uh some rather uh some other investment group and other uh, uh, VC firm. So I'd say growing that side of things. And then, yeah, I think probably in the next few years, definitely uh, become a father, to be honest. Next couple of years. Yeah, probably next no. next few years. Yeah, obviously, I, I, listen, I grew up in a lot of areas of my life very quickly. Mm. And I think, honestly, I'm, I'm ready for it now. But mm. uh, I, yeah. Do you think you've, with everything that you got going on, you can put enough time aside to be there i guess it depends on what your parenting style is mm. i have friends of mine whose dads were around all the time like every single day would come back from work all this that. and i have friends of mine whose parents would uh travel a lot or, and you know or their dad would travel a lot for work and he'd go sometimes on you know multi-week sometimes even multi-month expeditions to do something related to his business or his line of work or this that and it's been my observation that my friends whose dad was gone f for a large part of the year, they have they have far more respect and they have far more admiration. And I think they mm. seem to prefer it because I just don't think it's the role of a father to sit and baby and coddle children 24 seven. And I, I do think you need to see your- Especially in the early years. Yeah, no, especially in the early years. I mean, really at that point, there's there's no, yeah, I, I don't see a point. So for me, I think my role and my responsibility would be to make sure that my family is safe, my family is taken care of, and to make sure that I'm going out. And in the same way, you, you know, you asked me why haven't you done podcasts? I guess I have that same philosophy, which is like, let me go live some life. Because mm. even if we did this podcast a year ago, there's so much that I've learned in a year and there's so much that I've gone out and I've had an interest in it. I've had to learn these skills and develop these things and come back with a new fresh perspective. And if we do this again in a year, which I'm sure we will, it'll probably be a totally different conversation. And I just feel like that's the role for me, at least the way that I would want to be a father is of course, be a present father. Um, of course, be there for the things that matter. And I'm not saying, you know, I'm going to be there two months a year, I'll still be there for majority of the time, but you know, have no qualms about traveling for three weeks mm -hmm. for work, for something related to work. Um, I saw a, a, a post or a TikTok where you said that you you missed not having a father or father figure to to speak to. Yeah, that was uh, last year. Mm. Uh, at some point last year, I, you know, as you said, there's very few people that could kind of relate. And I guess once again, sometimes I guess you have these fantasies in your mind. Sometimes. I started to fantasize for a couple of weeks last year. I was like, fuck, like I genuinely, I love my mom to this. I, I adore my mom. You can't, I can't tell my mom yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know how moms yeah. are, right? Like moms are there to like be a support, but like you can't offload on your mom. Cause she just, she doesn't, she doesn't, she, number one, she doesn't understand the really the full extent of things. And by the way, that could also apply for a dad as well. Um, but yeah, then she starts worrying. And then now you're like, your offloading has caused even more problems. You know, that's why sometimes like it, as a man, you it, sometimes it's a little tough to even talk to your mom about mm -hmm. things to full extent because yeah, then they start worrying and now you have twice the problems. Um, so at a point last year, I started, 
I just went through a, a couple week period where I was like, fuck, like I really have no one I can talk to. Mm. And, you know, I, I really like, I have no one I can call. And it, I guess for me, it's sometimes it's, I do have people ask me, they're like, oh, is it weird, you know, not having a dad? And for me, it's weirder to have a dad. Like it's weirder that I, like Father's Day would be a weird concept to me. Or like mm. the fact that like I have to call my mom and my dad is like a weird thing to me. So I like the fact that it's basically just me and my mom. Uh, but I went through this. Do you, do you ever wonder where your life would have gone, what direction it would have taken if you had been brought up in this happy family with both parents who get along with each other? Uh, I think. Do you think you would still have had that drive inside of you? I don't think you have the same drive. No, mm. I don't think the drive is there because you either do things out of inspiration or desperation. And by the way, there's some people who genuinely can do things out of inspiration. Mm. Uh, I am not one of those people, I'd say. Uh, I don't think that's a bad thing either. I think I'm a person that thinks very pessimistically and that I like that. Like I, that drives me. Like I like the fact that I'm, I like being ultra prepared for situations uh, rather than like, I have friends of mine that are like, oh, I'll work out. I'm never like, you'll never hear me say that. Oh, I'll work out. I know, listen, from a, a spiritual level, I do believe in the end it will all work out. I do believe that. But I think, you know, they'll be like, they have a massive issue in their life and they're like, oh, I'll be fine. I'm like, no, I fucking won't. Um, so yeah, you know, it's, uh, that's really all to say that when it comes to having a dad, it's, it, it would be weirder for me to have a dad than, than, <laughs> than not have a dad. You know, I'm, I'm just so used to it mm. at this point. And, uh, but there was a little phase last year where I was like, I, I craved it, but, as I said, it's it, it was probably a fantasy more than anything. Because even if I did have a dad, once again, just because you have a dad doesn't mean that they they're going to be able to help you. Yeah. And this is one of the I'd say this is definitely one of the big advantages I had in life is I tell people all the time, just because you have a dad, that sometimes that can do more damage than it can uh, benefit. Because if you it, as a son, you're going to take on some of your father's beliefs. Now, some people take on ninety percent of their beliefs. And some people take on 10% of their beliefs. But if, this sounds terrible, but if fundamentally your father is, he's trying his best, bless him, he's trying his best, but he's, and most people are trying their best, but he's just not a competent or inspiring person. If he has- He's a, stuck in the matrix. If he has a shattered worldview, if he has, if he's been taught the wrong things, then now you're learning the wrong things. So I guess for me, it, it was, the pressure of like, mm. fuck, I got to figure out all this shit on my own. But the blessing of that is I had a clean yeah. slate. You might imagine if you, if your dad was there and you were like, dad, I'm, I'm dropping out of school. Yeah. And you're like, no, you're fucking not, mate. Yeah, no. <laughs> and, and, and the issue is you're going to take on, as I said, listen, uh, with the whole C19 stuff, like I really saw with my own two eyes. It's like, uh, imagine if your dad is like forcing you to mm. take these things. And it's like, yeah, this, I, I guess I just lost so much faith in men over the last like three, four years, mm -hmm. like I truly have, um, that yeah, part of that means that I, I came to a conclusion a couple of years ago. I'm like, oh, fuck, maybe actually it's like, it's a great thing I didn't have a dad. Yeah. Well, no, without a doubt, you're, you're a good role model for a lot of guys who are lost and need somebody to look up to. What advice would you give to those, uh, I guess those guys who have gone through a similar situation to you where they don't have the father figure in their life, what would you say to them? Be very careful who your influences are. Uh, be very, very careful who your influences are, what people you're watching, what people you're looking at, because they, it, I, I think it becomes especially amplified if you don't have a father in your life. The pe and I'm talking about the people online, even mm -hmm. the people you look at online, but start to become you're like, almost like your uncles, because you mm -hmm. don't really have that father figure to tell you, Oh no, that's not the way this works, son. So, I would just say, especially if you don't have a dad in your life who like, if you learn some stupid shit online, uh, whether that be once again, when it comes to relationships or business or worldview or wh whatever it is, if you learn some stupid shit online and you don't have that father to put you in your place and be like, mm -mm, that's not how this works. Mm -hmm. Uh, it becomes even more dangerous. So definitely be very careful yeah. who you're looking at online. Nice one. So I think we're going to wrap it up um, before finish. 
going to give Educate a little plug. I know you don't like to plug your own stuff too much, but I'll do it for you. <laughs> okay. Go and check it out. If you want to, what, what is Educate? Tell me. Enlighten so, me. Educate is basically masterclass. Mm. Uh, I'm very product focused and product driven. Educate is basically masterclass for hard skills. Mm-hmm. Masterclass is amazing. You know, I think it's a, it's a great platform, but like, I also don't give a shit about learning how to cook for $250 a year. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, it's great. Like it's interesting, but like at a certain stage, you just need to learn core practical skills. So educate is like masterclass for hard skills. So we've got educators that come on, you know, I'm in there at teaching agency. We've got educators, uh, the top sales expert in the world, uh, who actually works in my company looks through tens of thousands of, uh, or 10,000 plus, uh, sales roles per year. Uh, we've got, uh, my CMO who teaches copywriter, and then we've got a bunch of other programs coming out. So we've got guys like Jordan Welch, who's here in Dubai right now. He's coming on and doing a program inside of educate. So basically just getting the brightest minds in the entire world and giving you a full package of all the best ways, the, the highest income skills that you can learn. Mm-hmm. Um, and we do that for $125 a month. First year paid up front. And then from there, rolling month by month, can cancel anytime. Nice, man. Thank you very much for coming on. Much appreciated. And I honestly, I keep thinking, what is the 30-year-old Iman going to be like? Considering like everything you've achieved now at your age, it's mental. Yeah, who knows, bro? It's maybe mental. I'll just like, maybe I'll just be smoking weed every day and, just, and surfing. <laughs> you never know. You, you never know. Yeah. But awesome, man. Yeah, appreciate, appreciate you, bro. That. Thank you.